Castlevania 1 was so fucking cool. It was fresh and exciting and it felt great. Whippin' dudes, yeah, I'll get out of here! The best part though was that it clearly had a lot of thought put into it. For better or for worse. See, the thing you gotta realize about games in the NES days is that last stability was even then a big issue. Games were anywhere from 30 to 60 bucks and that shit's steep. You couldn't pay for that shit with your fucking lunch money. The NES cartridge didn't have a lot of space, so developers had to mine their limits, but also try to make a game that lasts a long time, so people felt like they got their fortunes worth. The easy out at the time was making a game that was frustratingly hard. Whoa, shit. Most of the time it was in cheap ways. <laughs> Castlevania took it a step further in the right direction. Somehow, at the beginning of the video game era, these guys knew what game design really was. They employed a lot of misdirection in order to create a difficulty level that was out of this world. The idea was that most kids just kind of plow through a game. If you did that in Castlevania, though, you got your balls rocked. <laughs> oh god! They planned everything around the path you would take if you just ran right through. Castlevania's level and enemy placement required you to stop and think for a second. To be careful and mind your surroundings. It made you take in the level design and quickly find an effective way to beat it. Or you could just die. <laughs> and, despite being this great vampire hunter, your whip had like this delay on it. This was intentional, jumping didn't have a delay, but your whip took a second to fire up. This added this huge level of depth to strategizing your attack, and it made plowing through enemies that much more of a non-option. In a way, it was kind of like a metaphor for being in an actual scary situation. You wouldn't just rush in like nothing mattered, throwing your fucking life away. You would stop nervously and assess the situation before slowly and carefully approaching danger. It was fucking great! And it felt smart and complex, and it was an instant classic. Yeah! And then they made a second one. So I know the angry video game nerd made a video about Castlevania 2 Simon's Quest, and I love him and that video, but I don't give a fuck! So here's what they did right in Castlevania 2. Number one! Game feel! <clears throat> so, Castlevania 1 and 2 employed the same basic elements. Attack with your whip, and kill enemies, yada yada, bing bong boo! But Castlevania 2 had better game feel in general. It just felt better. The whip sound effect was way cooler. And the death sounds were better. There were more enemies that took more than one hit, and they made wailing on enemies feel so much better. They added more of a freeze to when you hit the enemy that took multiple hits. Also, the little explodey flame was nicer, and it was a much better indicator of death. Because it was brighter, and it just... Looked like it popped out. It was clear you killed an enemy, or at least that you were hitting an enemy, and that felt good. It felt good. It felt good! It felt really good when I beat the shit number two! Day and night! Um, are, are you being serious? Yes, I'm serious. Come on, you're kidding. I'm serious! Look, okay, I know you've all seen the AVGN review, and he complained so much about that shit. Yeah, okay, maybe the little prompt was kind of tedious. When it showed up and it lasted for seven centuries as you're waiting to play. Okay, duh, that's a given! And they should have fixed that, but the concept of this element was new and it was exciting. You never knew when the world was gonna turn on you, and it reminded you of this kind of sense of looming evil. Silent Hill did the same goddamn thing! Y'all love it so much! Castlevania's theme was horror and fear. This was difficult in the NES days because, I mean... I mean, look at this! What is this even?! So they had to, like most other developers at the time, resort to using the game to set its tone. Can you believe it? How do you make a game that looks like this? Or this! Scary! For Simon's Quest, it involved making the player feel helpless somehow, afraid of something bigger that he can't explain or control standing in his way. This shit was scary, or at least unnerving. And it was especially scary when you were low on health in the middle of a long stretch and you're like, Please don't let there be a curse, please don't let there be a curse, please don't let there be a I mean, that prompt alone just scared the shit out of me the first time I saw it even. I was just like, him bim 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 WHAT IS HAPPENING?! Castlevania 1 didn't have that shit, it just had goofy skeletons throwing bones. <laughs> when are you gonna run out and fall apart?! But okay, I just like to give credit where credit is due, alright? Simon's quest is dumb, and it's stupid, and it's stupid, and it's dumb. Okay, here's what they did wrong! NUMBER THREE! TOWNS! AND THE RPG! The towns were dumb and boring and had nothing to do with hitting things with your whip. Okay, so this game added RPG elements where you had to buy upgrades from a store. Hearts that you collected from enemies instead of being your ammo for your alt weapon, which was the bomb, by the way. Instead are money to buy upgrades and other necessary objects for completing the game. So instantly this becomes farming and instantly this becomes pointless and dumb. These kinds of things were meant to elongate a game. They're made to manipulate you into thinking you're achieving something more than you're actually achieving. What? Huh? What? Uh, what? An element in a game wasn't made solely for me to have fun? Oh no... That's no... Let me ask you something. What is the difference between A. Killing a bunch of zombies to get hearts out of them, collecting the hearts, and then going back to town to get an item to go to another part of the game, and B. 
playing a game where you kill zombies that are obstructing your forward path to another part of the game. Answer four hours! See, this is the difference between Castlevania 1 and Castlevania 2, and this is pretty wholly the difference becomes the source of all the game's shortcomings. Simon's Quest is very manipulative. There's a lot of fucking running around. Castlevania doesn't waste your fucking time, and it gives you a goal to look forward to. A really tough boss battle that's exciting and interesting, and a ridiculous difficulty. Holy fuck, it's hard! Fuck this shit, it's hard! Fuck, oh, look at this boss I ever- What do I do? Number four! HEALTH AND CONTINUES! Castlevania was just straight up hard, but Simon's Quest dumbed down the difficulty substantially. And part of that was another thing that changed. No chicken. Just churches. See, these are the kind of analogies I love about video games. Castlevania 1 is to chicken, as Castlevania 2 is to churches. What the fuck are you talking about? Mysterious hidden roasted dungeon wall chicken in Castlevania 1 healed you, but in Castlevania 2, churches and towns heal you. So in Castlevania 1, if you needed health, you were f fucked! Unless you got lucky, or you knew exactly where all the chicken was hidden, and you were at a spot where there was, you know, indeed, chicken in the walls. In Castlevania 2, if you were man enough to make a pilgrimage to your local town, you could hit up the church and get all your health back. But if you died, you just kind of respond where you died. Okay. Well, whatever. But hey! If you fucking lose all your life, you have to continue, which still spawns you exactly where you died, but you lose all your hearts. So if you're headed to buy some super important item that you need to advance, and you have to continue, then you gotta fucking grind more hearts out of enemies and waste more of your fucking time! And wandering back to a town that's a bazillion miles away to get your health back wastes your fucking time! I hope you see where I'm coming from so I don't have to keep wasting my fucking time explaining it! Either of these things could have been toned down by making health drops or just even keeping the fucking wall chicken around, I don't know. The point is, they're wasting your time for no fucking reason. NUMBER FIVE! <laughs> THE PALLET! Okay, I don't know about you, but the first thing that struck me about Simon's Quest when I first started it up was how boring Simon looked. Makes me wanna... makes me wanna fall asleep. <sighs> Whoa, look at that orange! When Castlevania 1, he popped out. BAZAM! But all of the level palettes incorporated orange in some way, and often incorporated shades of blue, which is orange's complement. AKA, it makes orange pop out. It made everything really pop in general, and the game felt alive. In Simon's Quest, Simon got this dull black outline with red dark tunic. Snore! Stages often incorporated very dull, washed over color combinations and rarely added any splashes of color in small details like Castlevania 1 did. <gasps> to its credit, Simon's Quest incorporated a lot of green, red's compliment, but it was all muddy and mostly stayed in kind of this safe dark palette and never deviated too far into the brighter shades, like Castlevania dared to do. Overall, it felt boring and it had no soul or character. All the levels kind of just bled together into one big dark gray mess, which kind of reflects the entire game really. Whoops, did I just say that out loud? Towns were without a doubt the worst culprit of bad palette choices. An entire town was all one flat, uninteresting color. Go indoors. It's all blue. Go outside. It's all red. Night comes and it's all dark blue. I mean, seriously. <laughs> I know the NES has a limited palette, but come on, give me some contrasting colors, give me some compliments. Give me something interesting to explore and look at! Number six! Stupid enemy shit! So, as I mentioned before, Castlevania 1 has genius enemy placement, and it was wicked memorable, and it gave you the sense that the game was thought out, and it was just so hard! Like, yeah, okay, it was all possible, but it wasn't like the controls were bad. You just had to strategize your jumps and attack at the right time, but holy fuck, it was so goddamn hard! It was so hard, dude! It was frustrating, and it would put you in a shitty mood because you keep fucking dying, and dying, and dying. When you beat it, though, it was super triumphant, but it made you, like, even more stressed out for what was to come. God damn it! Anyway, sorry. So basically, Castlevania 1 is the perfect example of the advantage of linear gameplay. You can plan around one scenario. The player is coming in from one direction in any situation. And you can plan enemy and level placement accordingly. You can really give the player a tight, consistent experience that they'll remember FOREVER! But look, in Simon's Quest, like, the enemies were in places that were just asking to die. Like, check out this part where I'm just naturally jumping and swinging and I'm landing hits on every enemy without a second thought. Look at that! Castlevania did like the opposite of this, especially with shit like the Medusa head. <laughs> the problem here is that Simon's Quest is way too open-ended. Stuff is all scattered everywhere and it's easy to miss things, so you're gonna be doing a lot of back and forth through the same areas you've been through over and over and fucking over. I'm sick of these fucking blobs! Ah! Oh, they're back! So with that in mind, the developers realize they can't have these complicated, ridiculous enemy layouts in the game because nobody's gonna backtrack through this. 
<sighs> and even in the mansions, they expect you to backtrack out of them. The one place you would think the enemies would be planned out really well. It's just like they didn't really want to put any effort into it to begin with. So, with all this cookie cutter enemy placement, why did they even keep the sloppy whip controls? It still has a ridiculous delay and it still freezes you in place when you're standing still. If the point of the enemy placement now is to be able to dispatch them all pretty quickly when you're backtracking, why is it still slow as fuck? You really start to feel the effects of the clunky movement when the game isn't planned around it anymore. And that's really the ultimate key to all this. Castlevania feels well thought out. It feels planned and complete. But Castlevania 2 just feels like a fucking mess. NUMBER SEVEN! THE BOSSES! Okay. Okay, this is kind of a personal point, but it was a little underwhelming to not encounter bosses in all the mansions. When they finally did show up, like, 50 hours into the game, you were pretty decked out with awesome shit and you could just fucking destroy them in a second. Castlevania 1 had neat bosses at the end of every stage and it was wicked. It had, like, this build-up and this payoff when it restored all your health and you advanced to the next crazy stage that was all different and had different music and everything. You felt like you were accomplishing something. You felt like you were going somewhere. NUMBER EIGHT! WHERE DO I FUCKING GO?! This is probably the most common complaint, and it is a huge glaring issue. Simon's quest is so convoluted, it's a wonder I could even finish it with a fucking walkthrough. So you can talk to townsfolk and they'll tell you shit. First of all, there's way too much shit. Way too much shit. So right away the villagers start telling you like 70 things at once, and how the fuck are you supposed to remember every little detail? So get out a pen and paper and start fucking writing that shit. When do I stop?! But nothing they say is helpful. It's all cryptic, and some of them lie to you. Once you actually know what to do by reading it in fucking English on GameFAQs or something, you'll run into the villager who said for you to do that specific thing, and you still can't even interpret it as what you were supposed to do. Kneel next to the wall on the far left, or whatever, is... Hit your head on the top of the... What the fuck?! How to fix it. Okay, see now, what I think is kinda nice is this dude named the Almighty Guru did a ROM hack of Simon's Quest called Simon's Quest Redacted. And they did a couple things way right. Number one, the text crawling is wicked fast. Number two, all the dialogue is rewritten in fucking English, so people say things that actually clue you in on what to do. Number three, the night and day transition is lightning fast. It was a really nice gesture, and it truly shows how creative some gamers can be. But when it comes down to it, the minor tweaks can't fix an ultimately broken game. See, everybody nags about all the little things that annoy them about this game, but if, if the game itself is bad, fixing those things won't really do much in the long run. Knowing where to get the items is great, whatever, but getting there is boring, jumps are frustrating, enemies are lifeless and forgettable, running around back and forth is tiring, grinding for hearts is a fucking chore, it's a fucking mess! The point is Konami tried something different with Castlevania 2 in order to make it last longer than Castlevania 1. That's the bottom line. They probably heard that people thought Castlevania 1 was too difficult, so they toned it down to give the player avatar strength, leveling up the player's avatar while still maintaining the basic level of difficulty throughout. It wasn't hard in the traditional sense, it was only only imaginary hard, because enemies took more hits if you didn't have the best whip, and dispatching more resilient enemies wasn't really a challenge, it just took longer. What was truly hard was avoiding Medusas and Axes and still being in the range of the night guy to lay some hits on him, and fuck! See, he, he took a lot of hits, but you weren't just standing there wailing on him, you were surviving this onslaught of constant shit, and every extra hit he took had serious implications and consequences for you as a player. Yes! Oh man, another one! The epilogue! <laughs> Castlevania 2's cheap last ability is easily identifiable because it falls flat in so many areas, aka it sucks! But the more recent Castlevanias have been using the exact same tactics that I've been complaining about. There's a lot of running around, you level up your strength, you have to get items in order to advance forwards, but these games get unreal praise. Why is that? It would be because they use design choices that complement all of the shitty boringness. Leveling up feels good because all those sparkly sounds and colors. It feels good to hit enemies. The hit sparks and sound effects are all really exciting. Moving around is fast and jumping on stuff is fun. You get a lot of power-ups that change how the game is played a little bit at a time. You get a lot of small rewards frequently. It's just very fast paced. It feels very conducive to mindlessly running around because you aren't constantly hindered by this choppy platforming and, and slow whipping. But are you getting anything out of it any more than you are when playing Simon's Quest with like a walkthrough? Do you feel like you're legitimately beating a hard boss or enemy by grinding for a while and getting the best sword and then wailing on him until he falls? Are you getting any sense of genuine satisfaction from having to run back and forth through places you've already been in order to get something that allows you to advance forward more easily? Or do you still feel the most satisfied when you use your wicked cunning to get around these super perilous obstacles? I mean, it's kind of like comparing a snack food to high-class dessert. You can just chomp away mindlessly at snacks because that's how they're made. They're addictive by nature. They just make you reach for more even if you don't really want more. But a high-class dessert takes some slowing down. It demands that you take a moment to really enjoy how complex and satisfying it is. 
In the end, you'll always think more highly of the high-class dessert because it gave you a feeling of true satisfaction. It's not designed to go on forever, it was designed to finish off a meal. Maybe it was so good you wanted more. But what you had was delicious, and you're glad you had it. Or you could just be a fucking pig and eat it all. <laughs> Oh boy, it's a Mega Man! This game's like a legend. It's pretty fucking good. I mean, I don't really feel like I need to sing its praises, but whatever. It's got tight controls, it's got a simple objective, it's just fucking fun to play. So go slap it in your nest machine and have a grand old time. Before 1987, when Mega Man came out, it was hard for a lot of game designers to understand what games needed to engross a player. You know, to, to carry you along, to keep you wanting to play their game about... squares. There really wasn't like a book written on game design, and oftentimes designers wrote books on why their game was fun. Like literally, you had to read through manuals, and even then the games were still confusing, and I don't even- Like inherent rules of game design didn't exist, so, so video gaming was treated like traditional gaming. You know, like, like baseball and solitaire, you just had to have someone like tell you the rules, and then you can kind of play after you watch someone else play a couple times and- I don't get it. And there's not really anything wrong with that, but what's unique about video game is that there are ways that you can teach a player as they play. And I'm not talking about fucking educational games, Mavis Bacon. <sighs> Number munch. I'm talking about teaching a player all about your game. You know, like, how to play it. Now usually when you hear things like, how to play, you think of things like a tutorial, or a bunch of stupid dumb menus to pop up that you gotta read, or one of these. <laughs> See, look, I know you're not a stupid kid because I say fuck a lot and you're okay with that. And I think it's kind of weird how gaming subject matters has been aimed more towards adults and teenagers with all the blood and the killing and the bam, boom, But the way games are designed seem like it's catering more towards kids who don't know what the fuck is going on with the world. They don't know Obama. Let me give you an example. This is a very scientific graph showing the amount of times a gamer says, yeah, I get it, during gameplay over the years. See, in the 80s, this very rarely happened because games were crafty about the way they taught players and they did a pretty good job respecting the intelligence of human beings. Sometimes they made things a little too... Oh, man, what? Now you can see there was a rapid increase in... Yeah, I get it in the late 90s due to gaming hitting the mainstream. This is a result of game developers assuming the non-gamer masses are all dumb, and they can't identify simple patterns in their head like normal human beings can, and need to be able to do in order to be. And besides, no matter how stupid you are, I'm sure you don't enjoy when you're having a good time and all of a sudden someone comes up and goes, <laughs> no! Hey! You know what? You really need to do, you really need to jump over this open pit because it'll kill you! Okay, just wanted you to know. Okay, thanks. <sighs> so what does all this crap have to do with Mega Man? Well, everything, really. Mega Man's major strength, even way back in the 80s, has always been its ability to teach a player through its level design. It won't very often put you in a situation where you have to learn, like, immediately how to do something and then react faster than your brain can even fucking respond. Yeah, like that. Let's take a look at some examples! In Mega Man 1 and Guts Man stage, there are these platforms sliding along these little path lines. You jump on the first platform with no fear, whatever, and then you just kind of ride it out and then FUCK! Who the fuck is that thing? Whoop! Mega Man, Mega Man! There's a hole in the zipline that you- <laughs> No, shut up! I don't need you! Because look, the game shows me what it is. Before I even feel confident enough to jump down, another platform moves over it, and whoosh, okay. So there you go, I fall to my death. I'm glad I- I'm glad I knew that, so it wasn't fucking shoved down my throat by a robot chiming in. Get it? Mega Man 2, I'm sure you all know this. Quick Man stage has this segment where you just start dropping. But right away, there's these big yellow beams that are like, BOOM! <laughs> And so- Mega Man, Mega Man, come in! There's these big yellow beams that kill you if you SHUT YOUR MOUTH! I don't need you! Because look, the stage is shaped like a funnel, so it draws me towards the bottom. So I've got no problem feeling there's some tension in escaping these obnoxiously loud death beams, you dumb bitch. All around Mega Man 3, there's these green ball swinging dudes that- Mega Man, Mega Man, those are called Hammer Joes! They'll swing their mighty hammer around and then throw it, so you better watch your- <laughs> I already know this! Because look, the levels are all designed so it's uncommon for you to actually be in their line of fire once they throw their ball for the first time. The designers wanted it to feel justified when you got hit. It was your fault you got hit, not theirs. And overcoming that obstacle is more satisfying as a result, because you're improving by learning. In Mega Man 5 and Gyro Man stage, the- she gone? I'm fucking serious. Uh, okay. Alright, I don't think I hear anything. So, in Gyro Man stage, there's these flying spiky dudes that fall down on you, but you kind of have a lot of space to avoid them, so it's not really a big deal. But suddenly you jump on this weird platform, and because you're- Mega Man! Those platforms fall! Hey, no fucking shit! They're falling! They're fucking falling! I can see that! 
How many fuck? Ah! I'm going crazy here. <sighs> I'm sorry. I just. I don't feel sorry for you. Okay, so you jump on these platforms, and since there's really nothing in your way, you're just kind of like, oh, I'm just gonna keep going right. But then you see they're falling! And so after learning about both of those things, the spiky guys and the falling platforms, in a controlled environment, you're introduced to both at the same time. So now there's like this really big challenge, so you don't feel like nobody told you what the fuck's going on with the spiky guys and the falling rocks. So cool, alright? So after six games of Mega Man, with some slight changes here and there, people were like, Yeah, fucking Mega- whatever, Mega Man 12, was this, Land Before Time? And Capcom was like, fuck. People are losing interest in Mega Man, we gotta make new- WHAM! Holy fuck, this game's awesome! Look at the graphics and the music, oh my god, it feels so good! Uh, it's not on Sega Genesis, it's is Super Nintendo! See, this is a sequel, this is a fucking sequel! You thought I was gonna talk about bad sequels all the time on Sequelitis? Fuck no! This game makes my dick rock hard! Remember in the first episode, you know, what they did wrong, what they did right? Fucking please! This is... Why, why Mega Man X is so fucking good that it makes my dick rock hard! Also, I talk about what elements of the original Mega Man games were enhanced to be even more effective. Number one! The intro stage! Alright, so if you're a seasoned Mega Man Classic player, the first thing you'll notice about Mega Man X is that you don't immediately get thrown into a stage select. You always start out on an intro level. Uh... So, let me level with you for a second. Electrical engineering is pretty smart. General relativity, it's pretty fucking smart. The intro stage in Mega Man- FUCKING GENIUS! The classic Mega Man's had a lot of teaching tools strewn about its design, but the game itself was, you know, pretty simple. It was just a game about jumping and shooting. Jump and shoot! Should've been called Jump and Shoot Man. Jump and shoot! Hey Mega Man, what are you doing? Oh, nothing, I'm just jumping and shooting. What are you gonna do next? Oh, I'm gonna run and... I'm gonna run to the right and then I'm gonna jump and shoot! There weren't a lot of complex concepts in the overall design, so it didn't need a lot of time to teach you the basics. Mega Man X, on the other hand, has so much to offer, and it teaches you all of it in the first level. No, in the first fucking seconds of the game. It's nuts! So I'm gonna show you everything it teaches you on this little checklist here. I'm gonna check it off whenever it teaches you, alright? Okay. So let's turn it on and start this thing up! Okay, skip the intro. Uh, fuck. Shit. Okay. Okay, so, oh, look at that. You got a little Mega Man's on the menu screen. That's nice. See, right off the bat, that's kind of strange how he's the cursor, right? Usually it's like an arrow or like a finger or something. I don't know. Anyway, you press start and wham! Fuck, did you see that? He shot a little green blast out of his hand there. That was neato. By the way, this is important, so write it down. Cause I'm gonna do like a thing where I blow your fucking mind. All right, so moving on. So ready and teleporting. Bam, there's X. He's standing there. So, so let's just assume I'm like a fucking idiot, like modern game devs assume I am. I don't know what to do. I don't. I don't know what I'm doing. Okay, so I'm holding the controller. Uh, so there's arrows on this thing, and maybe the right arrow makes me go right. Oh my god! I'm moving right. Holy. So there's a wall to my left, so I should probably go right, right? Yeah, that's cool, alright. So I'm walking, I'm walking. Giant wheel with spikes! Oh god, oh god, go back, 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 go so that wasn't a big deal. It's okay to make those mistakes. I'm good. I'm good. Unless I fall into a fucking pit. Oh, damn it! Okay, so I got a lot of lives too. Okay, so it's good to make those mistakes too. I'm ready. Let's fucking fuck this spiky dude up. All right. So if I can't walk through the dude, I must be able to do something else. All right. So uh, there's some buttons on this controller. Hit some buttons and what? Oh my god! I'm in the air. I'm jumping. Holy shit! I'm like a I'm like a jump man. I'm gonna jump over this guy. No biggie. It's cool. Yeah. I'm the fucking best. Holy shit! New guy. He's shooting things at me. I don't know what. Oh my god! Why? Okay. Okay. So I could jump over his things, but he's too tall to jump over. Maybe I can like... Wait a second. Flashback! On the- on the title screen, I shot a green thingy when I press start. So how do I... Oh, I'm gonna press buttons and... and yeah! Yeah! yeah lemons! Alright. I did it. I beat- I beat the guy. See, what confuses me though is that I shot a green thingy on the title screen, but... Um, I only shot lemons when I hit the button, and no other button shoots the green thingy, so what, what do I- well, how do I shoot the green thingy? Well, for the sake of pacing in the video, and for the fact that I'm gonna blow your fucking mind with this shit! Let's assume that I'm not willing to experiment any further than what I've done, and I'm a stubborn dick, and I just want to move on. So let's move on! Next up are some flying enemies. Just jump and shoot them. Holy shit, I can jump and shoot at the same time! This game's amazing. This is so cool. This is so goddamn cool. What the fuck? Is that a bee? Yeah. Just to let you know, there's gonna be mini bosses, and they're gonna be fucking awesome. This battle also acts as a small misdirection for a battle that's coming up that I'll go into when it happens. It's gonna play 
your fucking mind. Also, what they drop these enemies that have these long legs. They walk real slow, so you get just the right amount of time to realize that, that your shots are, are going through their legs. They're not hitting them. So you just try the big dumb head and BAM! They're dead. So now you know that there are certain enemies who need to be attacked at certain sweet spots. See, this entire situation is teaching you all the rules of the game. And do you feel like you're in school yet? Do you feel like Mrs. Twilliger's gonna give you detention for playing video games in class? No, you feel like you're playing a game, stupid! Alright, so let's get serious here for a second. Check this fucking shit out! Take down the Bumblebee Man and he falls and goes boom and now you're stuck in a ditch. Well, what the fuck? How the fuck am I supposed to get out of here? You go left, you go right, and there's no way out! What do you fucking do? Okay. So here we go. Bumblebee Man fell on the right side of the platform, but there's this little gap between him and the wall. Now when you're drawn to the walls, because there really isn't anything else to be drawn to, you hop up on the Bumblebee, run at the wall, and then you slide down the wall. Now you can easily observe your descent is slow, there's a little smoke trail coming up, so you try it again. And this time, hitting buttons. Usually, you know, the jump button, because that's the only function you've learned so far that makes you ascend. And bada bang, bada boom, you're hopping on the walls! And that's how you get out, good job. Now, now as a little additional bonus, on the right of the ditch, you see that there's health items and stuff, so, you know, if you want to test out your newfound ability, that you taught yourself, by the way, the game didn't whoop, mega man, mega! Yeah, you get the whole idea. You can go grab the reward, and it feels fucking great. Feels fucking good. But hey, you know, maybe this all seems silly to you, like, like, duh, right? Like, of course you learn about a game by playing it long enough, that's like an inherent thing about games, right? No. Like, think of a game like Dr. Jekyll and Mr. Hyde for the NES, for example. Everybody should play this game if you want to get into game design. It's a perfect example of doing nothing to teach the player about its limits and goals. Nothing in this game seems to make sense. Stuff happens at random. People hurt you, some people don't. You walk backwards as Mr. Hyde, I don't... No. Of course, the game itself has limits, it has rules, it, it, it is a game, but... It doesn't teach you anything about itself through the gameplay, and on top of that, the presentation's confusing, because all the clashing information you're being fed constantly. Just, just play this game for two minutes, and you will understand how poorly you can teach a player how to play your stupid game. The term used a lot for this concept is conveyance. And I think that's a fitting name. I mean, haven't you ever been playing a game and you're just like, What do I do? Where do I go? That's what I'm talking about. That's bad conveyance. Alright. <clears throat> okay, so now, are you ready to get your mind fucking blown? Cause this is where I'm gonna fucking blow your fucking mind. So you get to the end of the level, gotta beat some stupid cars or whatever, I don't fucking know. Right now, cars! <laughs> then this fucking huge ass dude comes down in a giant robot man suit and starts wrecking your shit. Fuck! All the things I've learned, all the things I've applied aren't helping me! He's just fucking wrecking me! How weak and helpless do you feel? Mind blow number one. You have no idea if you're hurting Vile or not, so you don't have any idea whether or not this is a scripted sequence or not, because the first boss you fight in the game, the bee, doesn't have a life bar. So how are you supposed to know whether or not Mega Man X goes about the same conventions as Mega Man Classic? What if all the enemies don't have life bars? You don't know. This helps drive the helplessness point home. You have no idea what you're doing to this guy. Fighting for your life. <clears throat> so to add insult to injury, he traps you in a little electrical cage thing, and then he grabs the shit out of you, and he's like, and you're like, ah, and he laughs. <laughs> and you cry, but what was that? Whoa, fuck! That's the blasty thing I saw earlier on the title screen! That's what I want! I want that! How do I- What? How do I do that? And who the fuck is this... Person? Is that a guy or a girl? I don't, I don't fucking know. But then what's that? It looks like he's charging his shot! That's what the- Mind, Mind blow, blow number two. two. It all makes sense now! The green shot is the same shot that Zero fires, and I have to charge up my buster to do it! Fuck! Now I know! I didn't have to have somebody tell me with a whoop Mega Man, SHUT UP! So clearly this guy's fucking awesome, he just wrecked this dude you didn't even know you could do damage on, and then the dude's like, oh fuck, and just runs away. So he turns around, it, this guy's name's Zero by the way. So he looks over at you and he's like, look, X, let me level with you for a second. You're strong, but you're not as strong as I am. But check it out. Someday, you will be as strong as I am. What the fuck? This shit blew my goddamn mind when I was little. Forget it! I get to be as cool as Zero, fucking... Forget it! The crazy super blue buster shot, the dash, the fucking... The hair... I don't know. It's fucking Zero! I wanna be him! This, my little sequelitis of C's, is... 
This is called theming. This is what makes the feel of Mega Man X's story elements feel so potent. Everything in this game has to do with Mega Man X growing stronger. And all the elements are clear. You not only have the personal parallel character, Zero, who represents how strong you will become, but also the goal to defeat Vile, who at this point in time, you can't even visibly damage. And this isn't just experienced in cutscene or anything like that, it's also expressed in gameplay. You get to feel the utter helplessness of being so weak as a player. You don't have to empathize with the character on a screen, the feeling happens directly to you. So now you have true motivation as a player. You want to defeat this asshole you couldn't even damage, and you want to do it by becoming as strong as Zero. How do you do this? By playing the fucking game! You find the armor, you beat the enemies, you ride on the cool roller coaster thing. All the armor upgrades, which by the way make you look more like Zero, the health upgrades, the enemy upgrades, they're all motifs of the theme of growing stronger. Everything that makes Mega Man X unique resonates to the theme it establishes immediately, and through to the end, you feel something. A connection to the hero that not a lot of games can successfully manifest. Something you legitimately desire as a player is something that's relevant to the game's story. Your desire to surpass Zero and defeat Vile are both gameplay elements that are fun and interesting. Theming. Intro stage. Fuck. Number two! Movement! <sighs> okay, so let me cool down for a second. Mega Man Classic had super tight controls. Nobody can argue that. The movement was at a really nice, unfrustrating speed. Your hitbox was really clear and square-like. Jumping felt good because you could control the height and you could also control your trajectory mid-air. How does it even work? Now, what's interesting is Mega Man X's controls were nearly identical. Seriously, the speed, the jump arcs, they're, they're pretty much spot on from the first games. I mean, why fix what isn't broken? But now there's two factors that dramatically change the way the entire game is designed. Wall jumping and dashing. An ability Zero had! How about that shit? Now, it seems like two really simple upgrades, but everything is different now. The way you avoid enemies, the way you can approach enemies, the way you can traverse obstacles, everything. These two movement options give you the ability to go more places much more easily and much more quickly which means the terrain had to expand to accommodate. Mega Man Classic focused a lot on single-screen obstacle course type layouts, which were basically rendered obsolete by dashing and wall jumping. Not to mention, the flow of the game's openness would be fucked up by the super slow screen transitions from Mega Man Classic, which have all been completely eliminated except for the boss battle introduction room, which in my opinion actually increases the drama even more so before a boss battle, because now there's a huge contrast from how the rest of the game goes about its scene transition. Now dashing also uniquely influences another change in terrain, slopes. The ability to ascend, but still maintain a dash and not have to run into a stupid fucking wall, was essential to keeping the game's flow intact. Now wall jumping exclusively affected the abundance of vertical segments. Mega Man Classic tried the whole vertical thing with the Elect Man stage in Mega Man 1, and they were fucking dumb and hard and fuck! And they didn't revisit them unless they involved some sort of gimmick like the bubbles in Wave Man's stage, or straight down falling like Quick Man's stage, which comes a lot more naturally to Mega Man's control scheme because I mean there's gravity. Which... Uh, gravity... fuck. So, that's it. That's number two. NUMBER THREE! <sighs> Man, I just like Mega Man X. I mean, I'm serious, I fucking- this is like my favorite game, so I'm just gonna like- I'm just gonna gush right now, okay? I'm just gonna gush. Dude, wasn't it fucking awesome when you used Boomer Kowanger's weapon on Flame Mammoth and his trunk came off? That was so- Yeah! Fuck, wasn't it so neat how you could like ride in like a giant mobile suit armor and like punch shit? <laughs> Oh man, wasn't it the bomb getting the fucking Street Fighter Hadouken and then like trashing Vile like- like in one hit, just BAM, yeah, fuck you! All that stress you gave me in the first level, I don't even give a fuck, yeah, fuck you! Wasn't it cool how, like, Storm Eagle stage was, like, it wasn't even, like, in a, like, a box room, it was, like, outside on an airship, and you were like, Oh, fuck, he's flying around, where the fuck is- Isn't it cool that if you, like, decide to skip the- to getting the mobile suit armor thing, then if you just walk forward as regular X, the other enemies that are in mobile suit armors, they're actually outside their mobile suit armors, so you get, like, a chance to kind of, like, stand a chance against them, because they're fucking hard, right? And then if you kill them before they go into their mobile suit, you can steal it, and it's- God, it's fucking brilliant! You know how Sigma- you know how the last boss Sigma is like really fucking hard even if you have full sub tanks? So like you use up all your sub tanks and then you die and you're like, well shit, now I don't even stand a chance because I couldn't even beat him with four sub tanks. But the level right before you go up to Sigma has like these infinitely spawning caterpillars that you can just kill with armor armadillo's charge thing and you can just stand there and be like and just kill him and then your sub tanks get filled up in like a second and then you can beat Sigma again. It's fucking brilliant! It's amazing! God! All right, so that's it. Just go on eBay and and buy a Super Nintendo, unless you already uh, have one. Uh, fuck.
Just go. Just play Mega Man X, all right? It's good. I swear, it's fucking good. If this makes me th that excited, if I can, if I can tear down Castlevania 2, which is people have been like, oh, it's a good game, and I'm like, Mega Man X is the best game ever, then you better fucking play this game because it's it's good. Right now, cars. <laughs> Hey, so Castlevania 4, Super Castlevania, Super Castlevania, Super. So I did that sequelitis episode in Castlevania 1 and Castlevania 2, and it was a hoot. But I wanted to make some mention of some stuff in Castlevania 4, Super. Super Cast. You see, Castlevania 4 gets a lot of praise from some of the gamer guys because it doesn't have a lot of the stupid RPG bullshit from Simon's Quest, and it tries really hard to bring back Castlevania to Castlevania 1. But Super Cast! See, like in Castlevania 1, when you jump, you just kind of just committed to a super weird your jump arc for the next two seconds, and you can only whip forward, and it takes a while to whip, and for some people, this control scheme is that's unacceptable. <laughs> Castlevania 4, on the other hand, made movement much more accessible. It's faster paced, and you can whip in whatever the fuck direction you want, up or down or diagonal or... You can jump and then control your mid-air velocity, and everything is just a little more freeform, so you don't gotta buy a fucking engagement ring for your jump arcs. But the question that I think is really important here isn't whether or not this is better than Castlevania 1 or 2, or whatever the fuck one comes between the second and fourth ones. The question is, how does this change Castlevania? This question is important because everything in Castlevania 1 was deliberate. The reason items exist is because your whip is so clunky and slow, and jumping is such a major pain in the fucking ass that maybe sometimes you just want to throw an axe. Maybe you just want to toss crosses around it. Oh boy, it came back. The items were essentially the meta in Castlevania. Knowing what's ahead and planning your items accordingly was really important, and as we know, that's what Castlevania was all about. Being careful and planning things out. It was much easier to get through certain situations by being able to throw shit upwards in an arcing motion or throwing bottles of perfume at the ground to make shit smell nice. Basically, in Castlevania 1, whipping stuff was not an optimal solution to killing things, and it incentivized you to get better with the items. Castlevania 4 threw it out the fucking window! Whipping was all that mattered! It's fast, it's efficient, it's the strongest thing you have! Why the fuck do you even need the items. Like, check this shit out. In level 1-3, there are these goofy shrub seaweed whatevers that fall from the ceiling and crawl along the ground like a dumbass. You conveniently have the smelly perfume item you throw on the ground to attack them, but oh wait, whipping them and ducking is equally as effective. Sorry guys. Cool, man. In level 2-1, you get the axe early on that's clearly meant for the spiders that come down from the sky, but you could just whip diagonal up at them. Even the tiny spiders they shoot are in the perfect trajectory to fuck them up with one In level 2-3, same deal, you have the axe when the waterfall is pushing you down and it clearly wants you to kill all these bats and hands and whatever with the axes, but whip a good! In level 3-1, the game gives you the holy perfume to take out these splitting mud monster things. And since the flame it leaves lingers, it attacks them adequately. But you can just stand there and wail on them until they die, and it's actually a better fucking solution! In level 3-3, there are these skeleton, skeleton snake, snake dragon, dragon heads, heads from, from the wall. wall. And you have the axe, so it makes sense to use it, right? But you can just get in from behind and whack it with the whip without any risk- <laughs> Where are the fucking items even here?! The items did not change to reflect the differences in Castlevania 4's game engine, and the overall design was fucking sloppy! How many times did you throw the knife? Seriously? HOW MANY TIMES?! Look at you, you're a fucking giant! Shit's always in your reach with your long-ass whip. Knives are pointless and they suck! Oh man, come on! This is a huge change in the feel of the entire game. Notice in Castlevania 4 that hitting lanterns felt a little more tedious since the rewards were less important. Notice how you can rack up the hearts and not even notice. Near the end of level 1, I had 86 hearts. Halfway through level 3, I had 73! Notice how when you pick up the knife, when you had the boomerang cross, you, you don't even- you don't even care! In Castlevania 1, that shit would've driven you fucking insane! But here, uh, you can, you can whip diagonal. You can whip diagonal. Please don't think this is a bad game or a bad sequel. This is an ungraceful sequel. The developers took all the nostalgia from the game, updated the feel to be more accessible, and didn't really think about how it would change everything around. If a brand new game was built from the ground up with Castlevania 4's engine, no one would even think to add something as redundant as a fucking arcing weapon or a throwing knife. The game would probably be designed all around the whip. There'd be more stuff like the swinging hooks. Instead of trying too hard to emulate some kind of source material, the game would have had tons of new ways to interact with the environment and the enemies with the whip. Again, I don't feel that Castlevania is a bad bad game by any means, and fuck, it has like a million levels! But it is a bit misguided, and I feel like it has too much mispotential to not be slightly upset by it. A preceding title should act as an inspiration for a sequel. 
a launch pad aiming the production towards greater things. The sequel shouldn't be weighed down by irrelevant tradition for the sake of consistency. We've already played the first one, let's see what new stuff the second one can show us. Or the fourth one. The second one was dumb. But you know what, go play Castlevania, see what I mean. I ain't trying to be some deterrent here, I'm just saying... You know, I'm just saying. I'm just saying! Wait, that was it? The Legend of Zelda! It's a series so huge, I couldn't help but say it all. Ooh. But its hugeness is mostly... Hey, uh... Hey, what are you doing over there? Oh, <laughs> uh... I was just writing my preemptive counter-argument about how you're wrong about my favorite game of all time and the best game ever. Oh, okay, well... D don't you think that's a little... I don't know, close-minded? I mean, I get you probably liked this game as a kid, but... Isn't it time we looked at it critically and made a fair analysis of how- No! <sighs> okay, ask anybody about Zelda. Anyone can tell you what makes a Zelda game a Zelda game, and what a game needs to be to be a Zelda game. But is that description you'll get really what describes a Zelda game at its core? Is it possible that following this formula might actually be missing the entire point of what makes Zelda awesome? Or even what makes a sequel awesome? I mean, Zelda's a game where you swing a fucking sword at some pigs or whatever, and there's bombs, triangles. Got three triangles! Do it! In Zelda, you were an adventurer, and, well, seriously, that much wasn't even explained. You were just a green dude! Walk to a cave! Old dude goes, hey, take this! You're like, okay, it's a sword. You're swinging at monsters that shoot rocks and shit at you, and you have a great time killing them. You figure if there's a cave I get a sword in, there must be other caves to get other shit in, right? Maybe other swords? I don't know. This world's neat. Well, that's Zelda. And whether or not Zelda is what it is now, that's how it started. And that's what sold a bazillion games! A trillion million games! Look at how many games there are! And then, uh, then eventually the Linky came out, whatever, I really And then, A Link to the Past! Ba -ba 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 -da 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 -da. It was like the definitive Zelda, right? It felt like the first Zelda, but there was so much more. Bigger world, more things going on, it was nuts! My eight-year-old mind couldn't take it. Was I eight? I don't remember. But still, it changed a lot of things. This guy, Link, was given a name and a purpose. Rescue the princess! Save Hyrule! You have an uncle. I don't know what his name is. He dies. In Link to the Past, you start out in a house. You're forced to head up, sneak into a castle, fight some guards, rescue a princess, and bring her through an underground tunnel to some church or whatever, so you can finally go out, have your world to enjoy. Okay, cool. But okay, you want me to talk to some old lady? Okay, then what? Oh, find some kid who knows about where some old dude is? Okay, so... Okay, so here's the old dude? Okay, so go into this temple? Okay, beat the temple? Okay, listen? Not your fucking servant? Why do you give me this world to explore and have a good time in, and then you tell me to do these super specific things? You don't throw a six-year-old into a sandbox and say, Hey, you can only make poopy castles. You know when you take wet sand and you just let it drip on top of a pile of sand? It's a poopy castle. I mean, exploration still exists in Link to the Past, and God knows it's required to beat it. But if a game is telling you to do specific things with marks on a map and a sequence of which things to do and specific instructions, you're not discovering a world. You're being taken on a tour. You're no longer a pioneer adventurer, you're a guest at Disneyland. Here's your ticket, be sure to check out Space Mountain Indiana Jones before you leave. Yes, Goofy's weight! Win a prize! 120 pounds? No. It's too low. The whole game, it feels a bit more processed. It feels a bit more planned. You have a mission, and the mission is laid out for you. And that kind of thing is fine. I mean, I go to Disneyland like six times a year. I fucking love the Blue Bayou restaurant. They got great food. Oh! That's a little pricey. But you know what it's worth it. But Zelda, from its roots, it's not the kind of game that holds your hand. There's no explanation or even really like a goal. But there's adversity everywhere. And you can approach it anytime you want. Whether you're prepared or not. You run the real risk of facing off against something that will kill you in a fucking second! It's fucking awesome! But if you look at A Link to the Past and The Legend of Zelda from a surface level, they seem the same. There's a bunch of dungeons you get items for. Bombs, triangles, boomerangs, oh my! With bosses and a final fight with a giant pig man, there's a big world with caves and bushes! But it's not the same. There's a shift in soul, a difference in how you perceive and experience the world. Is it better? Is it worse? I don't fucking know. But it's not the same! Oh my god, look at that! The clouds are parting, and the heavens are sending us a message from above! Our eyes squint and adjust to the heavenly glow, when we finally can understand what it says. Hey! There's a 3D Zelda coming out! 
Oh my god. The Legend of Zelda Ocarina of Time. It's a game considered by most to be a masterpiece. A 3D world with delicious sound and amazing graphics. At the time. Each dungeon in each town feels unique and has its own energy to it. We were all fucking floored. It was so epic. This is what felt like gaming was leading up to. It felt like a natural progression. It felt like witnessing a fish grow legs. But not that one. It's it's really gross. So now, we have this 3D world, and it felt like that was what made the difference. But what exactly was different? Well, in order to examine that, we have to examine dreaded transition from the second dimension to the third dimension. If we've learned anything from Sonic the Hedgehog over here, it's that turning a 2D game into a 3D game, it ain't easy. It ain't even fucking quantifiable. How do you take the simplicity of form that 2D allows, give it a Z-axis? Everything changes! And it seems to turn a really good game design into a completely fucking broken one. Oh god. Oh my god! To me, don't look. Just look at that! Just look at- I mean, but Zelda, that one's not too hard. It already technically has three dimensions. You got the Y axis, the X axis, but you know, you could go upstairs, enemies could jump over you, all that stuff. Well, that's where the differences start. See, Link to the Past had a selective Z axis. For example, y you couldn't be on the second floor and attack a dude on the first floor, but if the sandworm boss soared over your head and you weren't harmed by it, you could still swing at it and it'd register a hit. Bats fly through the air, but they're always conveniently at sword's height. That shit's asinine in 3D, which ironically in this situation is a limitation of the medium. The more specific you get about situations analogous to reality, the more you have to stipulate on. You can't hit a bat from any Z-axis position distance. Now it's really clear where the bats are in 3D space. They're up, down, every fucking where. And aiming your sword would be retarded. Hey! I see you there, Lumen. Dude, man, I'm sorry, I'm just curious. So what do we gotta do to remedy this Z-axis problem? Ladies and gents, I present you Z-targeting. Pesky bats flying from every which way, trying to circle around a style post without losing track of where it is relative to you. Have I got a treat for you? Just press the Z button and lock onto the nearest baddie and have a go with your mighty sword device. Check it out. Z-targeting made combat complicated. And that's not a bad thing. No more simple point and swing stuff here, folks. You get a lock on, Focus on the fight. This is a gigantic difference, and it makes combat complex. Now, I don't say this a lot, but let's see how this is a good thing. A new method of combat means new ways to go about designing enemies in combat situations. You used to just point and hit. Hit and run. <laughs> what the fuck, man? But now, there's rolling, dodging, stabbing, swinging, leaping. Holy shit! So complex. So many possibilities. It's so deep they can make an entire game based on the combat system. But guess what? They didn't! Here's how this is a poopy bad thing! Z-targeting creates a strange disconnect from the world around you. It changes the camera angle from what you're used to exploring the world in, and that shifts your entire focus and outlook. It segments the game into two pieces. This is the combat piece, this is the world exploring piece. They don't mix. Put them in a room together, they get into an argument. Hey, fuck you! Hey, fuck you too! Dude, guys! Can't we just get along? What do you think this is? Link to the past? <laughs> like the man says, in the old Zelda games, those two pieces were linked. There were segments where you had to fight off enemies and explore the room simultaneously. It was much easier to manage it all, and now it's complicated and puts you in an unfair situation. I'm- what the f- what the heck was that all about? Z-targeting also puts a damper on throwaway enemies like bats, who were fun to kill in previous Zeldas, but are now a pain in the goddamn ass since you have to individually focus on each one and precisely hit them. It'd be like if you wanted to kill a bunch of ants in your house by stomping on them, but instead of doing that, you pointed a slingshot at each one individually. Now, okay, on the flip side, complicated enemies are a total joy to fight, but the issue then comes up of how they're even designed. Okay, so as I mentioned before, a lot of the charm from the original Zelda was how ruthless the game was, and a complex fighting system would be perfect place to implement that. But the source of a lot of Ocarina's problems is that the game's idea of difficulty is waiting. There is so much goddamn waiting in Ocarina. Every enemy has a period where they just stand around and do fucking nothing, and attacking them during this time is useless. Deku Scrubs, Stalfos, Lizard Men, Skulltolas, Wolf Dudes, Gerudos, Clams? Waiting is not a difficult thing to do, but it creates the illusion of difficulty because it takes up your time. And that's all it does. A fight feels like an ordeal when you have to devote a decent amount of time to it, but it's not hard. Just look at Final Fantasy IX, Skies of Arcadia, Grandia. These long ass battles, not hard but they feel like they're something. This is a mindless interaction, and you're simply going through the motions instead of strategizing. Wait, attack, wait, attack, 
Wait, I d it's not very hard to do, and it's difficult to mess up. This style of enemy isn't inherently bad. I mean, it creates an interesting player-enemy relationship where the enemy's controlling the pace of the battle, but the fact that it's a consistent theme in enemies gives the impression that it's used as a difficulty supplement, since none of these enemies are actually difficult to fight. Now, on the flip side, Ocarina has the coolest enemy ever, the Iron Knuckle. It's an enemy that is actually provoked to attack and also to be vulnerable by your own attack, which makes the pace of the battle completely dictated by you and your ability to fight it. Additionally, the nature of his attack pattern requires you to be aware of your surroundings. You can lure him to attack pillars, which yield hearts, to replenish your life, which is another layer of depth to the battle. This is the kind of enemy design Ocarina needed so much more of. A merging of combat and world, where you are still very aware of your surrounding in each set piece, even during combat. And the world around you affects your combat. I feel that this particular battle shows how Ocarina could have had an even better combat world connection than Link to the Past, or even the original Zelda, but chose to save it only for many bosses and some boss battles. Could have been every enemy. <sighs> In any case, the nature of Z-targeting forced Zelda to be more combat-centric, and with it, the world was forced to change. But it didn't. You still push blocks, only now you can't push them when you're engaged in combat, and you still open doors by shooting slingshots at eyeballs in the wall. Is that a puzzle? Like, seriously, is that a puzzle? Is looking around the room and finding an eyeball on a wall really super fun for people? Like, the game is 3D now, so everything isn't laid out before you like a map anymore. So I get that there's this sense that you walk into a room and aren't getting all the information about the room right away, but is stopping your forward motion, stopping everything, to look for a diamond to whack that's in a soulless crevice in the wall so you can open a door that leads to another room with a locked door and some other silly open sesame trick, is that fun? Is this what you want? Hey, come on, man, it's not that bad. Shh, Skyward Sword. Seriously, I'm doing like a show. I know, I just figured they'd give me two cents. I don't care. Nobody likes you. You took fun and made it unfun. How'd you even do that? Maybe I should go Dallas for a better game, huh? Hey, man, that's low. So's my interest in playing you again. Oh, shit. Burn! Burn! So I'm just really proud of what I've done today. Plus, I really hate you. All right, let me explain something. A puzzle is something you have all the information for. The only thing standing between you and the solution is your own ability to put the pieces together in the right way. The satisfaction you obtain from solving a puzzle is from the AHA moment, when the pieces fit and you have only yourself to blame for it. If you're missing a piece, how are you supposed to even get to a conclusion? You rack your brain, run in circles, go what do I fucking do? Until you find the last piece on a whim and suddenly it all makes sense. You say, well shit! Or, ah, come on! The satisfaction doesn't come from the door opening, it comes from the puzzle itself. If the puzzle itself isn't satisfying, well, there you go. The puzzle itself isn't satisfying. You see, in the original Zelda, you'd walk into a room, the doors would lock, but five cape horse sword dude looking guys who are fucking hard as shit surround you. They follow you around when they see you, you can only attack them from the sides or the back. You gotta find vantage points, ins, outs, manage your health, dodge them when they gang up. It's daunting, it's interesting, it engages you and it's really easy to understand. And because of all this, it's satisfying when you beat them. A door opening is like, oh, okay, cool, the door opened. You're not like, ah, fucking finally the door. But look, that's not to say puzzles or whatever can exist in Ocarina of Time's combat-centric universe, but sliding spiked death pucks coming out from around the corner you can't see is just bad fucking design. It's bad design in any game. It's no different in Zelda. You don't get a get out of jail free card you gotta roll three times! In the first Zelda, you see that shit. In Link to the Past, you see that shit. In Ocarina, oops! Yeah, I know, that's the nature of 3D, but if it doesn't work in 3D, you change it. If the formula doesn't work, you change the formula. Why do I gotta leap across these platforms? There's no challenge here. I hold the joystick up. Just cause the scenario's treacherous doesn't mean the game is actually treacherous. I could've just walked forward in a straight line. Heck, I can close my eyes here and do this. Is that treacherous? Can I just close my eyes and shoot at terrorists and surgeons and be like, oh, I'm fucking fine. Hey, or better yet, how about some nice interesting combat scenario here on these platforms, huh? Like some kind of enemy that'll circle around you and you just gotta time your jump across or like block his path with a bomb or something. Or like, how about an enemy you have to slash at enough to knock it off the edge, but when you slash him, he also kind of slashes and knocks you back like another well-designed enemy in some other fucking game. I just made that up. I didn't even- and it exists in a good Zelda game. Oh man, enemies in a good Zelda game? Are you talking about me? No. I'm not talking about you. Get out of my house. Go. 
I can't be too hard on Skyward Sword. It at least made bombs bearable to use. You throw a bomb and link to the past in four directions. Left, right, up, down. In Ocarina, you have infinity directions. You also have a really vague idea of where it's gonna land. Especially if you're throwing up or down in different elevations. There's so much room for error, it's fucking unreal. Z-targeting helps, but what if there are enemies around you you don't want to target onto? You just want to see straight. You just want to fucking throw a bomb! Skyward Sword added like a throw arc, but it also added bomb bowl. Bomb bowl. It added bomb bowl. Skyward Sword added bomb bowl. It added bomb bowl. Yeah, okay, fuck Skyward Sword. It still handles treasure chests dumb. But to be fair, Ocarina started it. You know, okay, in each dungeon, Ocarina has a unique item in a regular old treasure chest. In each dungeon, it just kind of shows up after a random battle with some enemies. Link to the Past had a giant fucking treasure chest that needed a big key to open. The big key also opened the door to the boss. There's like a genuine giddiness to finding a treasure with such a huge implication to it. The big key not only gives me amazing new treasure, but also allows me to face off against an incredible boss. The time it takes me to get back to the big treasure is like the most fucking suspenseful thing ever. It's like running downstairs to get the presents under the Christmas tree. Or, or menorah. Or like, whatever birthday tree. I often hear that this is a minor point, but it creates an emotional through line for a dungeon. It establishes an important, consistent relationship with the player and the dungeon. It creates goals. It creates expectation. It creates a good fucking game. A treasure chest in and of itself is a mystery and a sense of suspense. The original Zelda didn't have chests. It just had like new items sitting at the end of like a long hallway that built up tension. It gave you time to wonder about what it was and how it worked. Link to the Past added chests which was another means to the same goal, you know, building suspense. It's a fucking secret box. You see a present, you're like, oh god, I wanna open it! Simply walking to the chest is all the suspense you need. When you arrive, the payoff is instant. It opens right away when you hit the button. It shows what it is, done. I know, it may not appear epic, and it may seem kinda silly and video gamey, but the feeling of suspense is real and very valid. Ocarina decided to add in bullshit! Link opens up the treasure chest all like, what the fuck is- what is this? Oh my god, I'm amazed! Who cares that he's amazed? I want to be amazed! Just show the fucking treasure already! I beat the dudes blocking it! I climbed the ladder or whatever and got here! Why do I gotta wait? Just cause the game needs to be all epic and 3D wooshy wooshy cause of all the graphics and polygons and all that uh, whatnot. I gotta wait like, look at how many chests I can open in that time! God! There's so much waiting in Ocarina! You gotta wait for a door to close, you gotta wait for a character to stop talking, you gotta wait for the dialogue box to tell you how to use bombs for the 47th goddamn time! Wait for the switch to make a music tone and open a door across the room! Wait for Link to go flying backwards and then get up off the ground! Wait for bombs to blow up! How fucking long does it take to switch between worlds? You gotta play the Prelude of Light! Say yes! Watch the cutscene! Walk up to the Master Sword plot! Watch the cutscene! Walk out of the Temple of Time! Play whatever song brings you the closest to where you wanna go! Say yes! Yes, watch the cutscene, and walk all the way to where you want to be! And Link to the Past, you equip a mirror, press a button, you're there! <sighs> what the fuck am I doing with my life? I am harshly criticizing Ocarina of Time on the internet. I'm gonna get crucified! Waiting is the bane of exploration. Why would I want to explore in a world where I gotta waste useless time just to check a fucking room? You should never, ever, ever Hit that point where you're like, eh, I'll check that room later. In a game about checking rooms! I mean, you're exploring a world, right? And then they decide, hey, we're gonna streamline the dungeon process. Guess what? You enter a dungeon, halfway through, you get an item that helps you through the other half of the dungeon, and then you use that item on the boss to render it hittable. And then you hit it with a sword, typically in a pattern of three times. But that part can vary. Ladies and gentlemen, Please exit through the gift shop, try our Triforce Shaped Ice Cream Bars. Can you please tell me what about this world is interesting if I know, before I even finish the dungeon, what the boss battle's gonna be? Oh, I got a slingshot! Maybe I hit some big glowing object with a slingshot! Oh, a mirror shield that lets me reflect light at stuff! Maybe the boss is gonna be a dude that I gotta reflect light at! Look, I know you can argue that this is actually good game design, but a game where I'm adventuring, and I'm supposed to be excited about what's to come, it's kinda hard to wonder wide-eyed about something that's so predictable. It hurts. Ooh, darn! Ooh, jeez, arg! And this, like, streamlining process in Ocarina is present even outside the dungeons. Every little piece of this game is just hopping over some roadblock that needs you to do some specific thing to make it to the next roadblock. It's a game about jumping through hoops! 
Superman 64. Hey man, there's a closed door. Find the eye symbol, hit it with a slingshot. Another closed door. Find a key. Another closed door. Press a button. Another closed door. Give this dude a ladder from Impa. And again, look, there's some exploring, but a random secret cave in the ground isn't gonna lead you through a complex catacomb with a mini boss at the end. It just won't. It's not gonna happen. You'll fall, you'll get a treasure chest, go da -da -da -da, and fucking leave. They would not sacrifice the precious formula for a little bit of fun. Link to the Past had a little bit more variety. Sometimes the item you get in a dungeon isn't even a weapon. Sometimes the boss can be defeated with just the fucking sword. Sometimes the boss needs to be defeated with an item from a dungeon two dungeons ago. There's one boss that you have to beat him with an item that you don't even get in a dungeon. It still felt like an adventure. Like you had like this arsenal you've been collecting and you're using it whenever it may be useful. And it may be useful any time. You gotta be ready for that shit. Original Legend of Zelda had some dinosaurs. There's a dinosaur. So look at that, look at that dinosaur. There's a fucking dinosaur right there. It's this kind of misdirection of like what you should care about in Zelda that really bugs me about Ocarina. Like, let's take its story for example. Ocarina's story provides you with a context to your quest. That accomplishing this will save this or change this, but it refuses to acknowledge the player's innate sense of wonder and, and drive to quest and fight. Players want to fight bosses. They want to be rewarded for their efforts. They want to enter a dungeon, see what's inside, and succeed against enemies. But you gotta put that feeling aside. There are more important matters at hand. The Sheikahs are... The Hylians or whatever, save the Hylians. Gorons don't have rocks to eat. That's why you got a quest. Gorons gotta eat. The fuck are the Gorons? I don't even care! And then what we're left with is what feels like a formality. Dungeons with doors that need to be opened, bosses that are beaten in the same fucking manner every time. I think the idea that you're told you're a hero saving a kingdom is at least somewhat unnecessary. When it's an order delivered by the game, it becomes a task. It's like a job. The message should be in that, as a player, your idea of fun ends up making you a hero. Fighting monsters is what you live for and isn't what, say, this fucking guy lives for. Why aren't all these other dudes going out and fighting monsters and questing? Because they're not heroes. They don't find it fun. But you, the player, find it fun. You find killing monsters fun. You find ridding the world of evil things fun. That makes you a hero. Not the dialogue, not the story. A book can tell you the main character's a hero with dialogue. A movie can too. But a game? In a game you can feel it. You can experience it firsthand. You don't need dialogue. Why was the inclusion of so many semantics necessary? And I don't buy the argument that they're only there to richen the world with story, because adding those contexts to the situation is devaluing design aspects. The game literally stops for you to complete some asinine story task. Look, you go to Kakariko Village. You go to the entrance of Death Mountain. Dude won't let you pass. You go, what the fuck, man? I want to go up there. That's what I want to do, but no. You have to wait for the game to tell you why you want to go up there. You know why you want to go up there. You want to fight some dudes, fight a boss, get a cool weapon. But no, you gotta go talk to Zelda. Oh, the world is in And then Impa's like, hey, you know, this is really important, so we're gonna give you this note to give this guy. I don't care. Nobody cares. You seriously just made me waste my time, press A a bunch of times, so that I could go up there. Just like a fucking... There's a tiny wall standing between me. I could climb over it. I'm an agile kid. I could climb the shit out of that. I climb vines all the time. No big deal. Purposely misinforming the player about why they should care about what they're doing displaces their values. And it creates a you can't tell me what to do attitude towards the game. And that's the last thing you want a game to do. You don't want a game to nag at you, especially in a game with an open world. Just look at how many fucking people hate Navi and Fee. All they do is nag and tell you what to do. Who the fuck wants to be told what to do? Am I in a cubicle? Am I sitting in a cubicle playing a Zelda game? No. See, this is why I think the Master Sword is brilliant, particularly in Link to the Past, because it's talked about in literal terms. It's a sword that will make you more powerful and defeat evil. That's what it actually does for you, the player. There's no bullshit about avenging your mother or saving a village from persecution or giving Gorons rocks. There's rocks everywhere! What is wrong with you? Your whole town is made of rocks and you're starving? The Master Sword is just the sword of evil's bane. Fucking awesome! How exciting is that? A new awesome sword! Count me the fuck in! <sighs> And don't get me wrong, I don't think a world where people walk and talk is flawed, but having to trigger the ability to explore by walking and talking, it's annoying. It's like your mom. You can't have dessert till you eat your peas. Can't explore the dungeon till you play Saria's song for Goron. There are ways to involve characters in a story and not have them be utterly boring and detached from what you're doing. Why not have a Goron that helps you fight? It goes, 
blows shit up while you're doing stuff. Why not have the Goron stay healthy by eating rocks and they're slowly becoming rarer as you progress through the dungeon? And he's on the verge of fatigue. Shit! Don't you want to get him some rocks to stay the hell alive? Let's keep moving so my friend can live! See, I'm a video game player. I care about slashing things, finding things, having an adventure, not wandering around until I pressed A at all the right places in the right order for whatever fucking story reason. It's like the longest page turn ever. Imagine you had to walk across your house back and forth three times before you could turn the page in a book you're reading. Gosh, isn't that stupid? Wouldn't that be retarded? That's what you're fucking doing in video games! <sighs> Things just need to be simple. And what I mean by that is, Link to the Past added a story to make everything a little more epic. And since it was the same kind of game as the first, the game needed those tropes to come back. All those enemies and elements, while adding new ones too. But with that, a formula was born. A through line is important for a series, but when it acts like a, a catamari of tropes and elements that can't be forgotten or changed, things start getting sloppy and samey. We get games that become less and less interesting. Shigeru Miyamoto once described his idea for Zelda coming from the feeling he got from wanting to explore caves near his house as a child, which led to an amazing game where you explore caves and dungeons and found wondrous things. The irony is that when it came time to make sequels, Nintendo cared more about the things that were found rather than the mystery itself. There is no mystery in modern Zelda games. Hey man, I'm mysterious. God, shut up! Seriously! You want all this attention like you care, like you really gave it your all in a new innovative Zelda experience, but instead you let Zelda into a frustrating monotony. You know, what started the franchise was like the sense of wonder, and what has thus far concluded the franchise is a sense of formality, a predictable, time-consuming mess that asks you not of your sense of adventure, or even your wits, but instead your ability to listen and follow directions. You ask of us our ability to point something at something else and then walk towards it. You ask of us our willingness to get another bow and arrow, fight another boss with another giant glowing eyeball. Gee, I wonder how to fucking beat it! I fucking wonder, Skyward Sword! You ask of us to get a cat from the top of a roof and carry him over to some guy who says thank you. The Adventures of Link, Cat Delivery Man. Is that your title? What's the tagline? on in the ass, cats out of the bag, and onto the roof. 10 out of 10. No Wiimote motion issues here that could possibly cripple the entire experience. Best in the series. You're like a spoiled rich kid who gets everything bought for you your entire life. And then when it comes to making it on your own, you can't take it. You expect everyone to love you because you are who you are. Part of the illustrious Zelda lineage. Nothing could possibly be wrong with you. You look just like a Zelda, but you're not one. You're a pampered, doughy snob wearing nice clothes, expecting to graduate scot-free because your daddy's an alum. Why would you need to improve? Why would you need to get any better? Everyone just agrees with your shitty ideas because you're a Zelda. Fuck you, Skyward Sword. Fuck you. <laughs> Now, as I spent 373,000 years writing this freaking video, a new Zelda game showed up that made everyone pee their pants. You know, except me because I don't do that, it's weird. It was a direct sequel to Link to the Past, taking place in the same aesthetic world of Link to the Past. It's called A Link Between Worlds, and I love it. All right, look, it's worth mentioning that it does have nearly an entire formula ripped from a game, but it's fun. But why? Well, I feel partly because it has less wait time, but it's mostly because of the new mechanic, which is beautifully integrated to the point of feeling second nature, like jumping in a Mario game. On top of that, you have nooks and crannies around every turn that contained weird hidden stuff, and there's also this system of, of pay for an item that adds this interesting value to rupees that no other Zelda had. Not even Twilight Princess with its stupid weird fucking dumbass endgame magic not magic armor bullshit. Wow, look at that. Sure is expensive to die is what we're seeing, a commentary on capitalist society and life insurance policies choking the life out of middle America. Okay. What's more, nearly every item in A Link Between Worlds has multiple uses aside from its, you know, intended dungeon use, and has such a broad feel that they can all be upgraded to be even more useful. You know, while it does eliminate the mystique of finding an item, it allows each dungeon to have a spoil that feels less like it's in tandem with the dungeon. Like it's a treasure that you can enjoy as a general adventurer. Not not just as a house guest of fucking Mr. Vulnerable for a sec, glowy eyeball McWeek to arrows. Why did I leave my one weakness laying around my house? Oh no! Ow! Jeez, man, that's my glowy eye! 
I use that to see? So I think what I've been discussing this whole video doesn't seem like it applies much to this game at first glance, but it absolutely does. This game decided to switch up the Zelda formula from a different angle. And while it doesn't eliminate the Zelda staple items and constant reuse of existing enemies, it does something different in how you interact with all of them. And that's something different works. It changed how you explore the world itself, how you find things, and how you figure out things about the world around you. A stupid spinning dumbass top thing doesn't change anything. You find a track on a wall and you ride it. It's like a teleporter, but instead of being transported instantly, you just get there at normal speed. A double dumbass claw shot doesn't change anything. It just means instead of having to land on a platform and awkwardly aim to another claw shot target, you don't have to land on a platform when you awkwardly aim to another claw shot target. Thank God! But this shit? It changes how you view platforms, their relationship to one another, how you view distance, how you view the differences between low rule and high rule. It feels like you're exploring a world again. And the things you find are less important than the way that you find them. It's back to how it felt before. The reward was the fact that you did it! Not that you found a thing. And you know what? I think this may be Nintendo's way of easing people into being open-minded about a shift in Zelda. I mean, look at this shit! What? Hyrule Warrior? What the fuck does that even mean? Look, what the f what is going on? Holy crap! Oh my god, this big thing! Jeez, what? How could they ruin Zelda? How could they ruin my favorite thing? Yeah! I'm sure it's good. Hey, thanks for listening to me shout my opinion at you for fucking 30 minutes. I hope I can make you laugh and make you think. And not make you angry, because that wasn't my intention. But if I did... I'm sorry. Now it's time for me to write my post-emptive counter-argument. All right, fine. You watch the video, that's only fair. I mean, I've been throwing my opinion at you for 30 friggin' minutes. Just because you might like Ocarina of Time and I don't, doesn't mean that you're not a beautiful person. Because you are. Look at yourself. Oh, I would kiss you if I could. But I can't. I'm a cartoon. And hey, if you like sequelitis, you can click that subscribe button right there. And that'll let you know when new sequelituses are coming out. And hey, I did a sequelitis before this about Mega Man. You should check it out if you haven't seen it. And if you have seen it, well, you can watch it again. I don't know. And if you like Zelda so much that you gotta watch a whole video series of me playing it, well, go ahead and click that button. You can see my friend Dan and I playing the HD remake of Wind Waker over here. I know I didn't talk about it in this video, but maybe I will in another one. Hmm? And hey, there's an even newer Zelda coming out that they say is open world. What's the deal with that? What do you think the game's gonna be like? Do you think they're gonna stick to the open world? Or do you think they're just gonna go back to the Zelda formula? Because that would piss me off. I mean, I wouldn't lose sleep over it, but you know, I'd just be a little disappointed, I guess. It wouldn't piss me off. And now I'm just gonna stare at you for a couple seconds.